Hello and welcome to State Matters. I'm your host, Matt Miratori. We are very honored here with us today, one of our six constitutional officers from the Commonwealth of Mass. She is a former Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development and former state representative. When she was in the private sector, she worked as a business advocate, legal counsel, and a member of numerous nonprofit organizations, such as the South Shore Chamber of Commerce and St. Francis House. She's a graduate of Boston College and Suffolk University Law. She currently leads a 225-person workforce of auditors, fraud investigators, and researchers to improve government accountability and build trust in government. She is a 25th Auditor of the Commonwealth and the first woman to serve in this role. Please join me in welcoming State, Bo State Auditor Suzanne Bopp. Auditor, Thanks so thank much. you. I'm thank really you for coming. delighted to be here, Representative. Oh, it's great to have you here. Thank you. I'm very honored to have you here, and thank you for your time. And um, as we said before we came on the air, I, I love doing these shows. This is my 92nd show that I've done over the last decade. And uh, I love doing these shows because I get to learn about all these roles. And, and your role is a fascinating role. But let's just start about you first. Let's find out who is Auditor Bump. Where well, you grew up and all that good stuff. Well, I'm a South Shore girl. Yes, uh, grew up we have in that the, in common. <laughs> yep. I grew up in the town of Whitman. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, Dad was a funeral director. Mom mm -hmm. stayed at home and raised the, uh, the four of us. Mm -hmm. I uh, went to Cardinal Spellman High School, as and then I. as you saw, <laughs> yeah. as you saw it, BC, uh, um, BC for undergraduate, and, uh, uh, and then Suffolk uh, Law School. I went nights while I was uh, in uh, my first job right out of college was as a legislative aide. Uh, well, who was that with? That was uh, State Representative Elizabeth Mateo okay. from the town of Braintree. Okay. And while working for her, I moved from Whitman to Braintree. Mm -hmm. And when she retired, I uh, ran successfully for her seat and served uh, four terms in the Massachusetts House. I got to do some really neat stuff. It's a great so job, this isn't is, it? Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, yeah. Uh, from 1984. Five till 1993, I mm -hmm. was the state representative mm -hmm. from Braintree and got to chair the Committee on Commerce and Labor in my last, mm -hmm. uh, in my last term. Um, was out of office for a number of, uh, of years, as you indicated in the, in the, in the bio, uh, practicing law, uh, representing uh, recovery homes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the statewide network of recovery homes as a lobbyist mm -hmm. before the legislature. Um, trying to deal uh, with uh, folks trying to get out of the clutches of addiction, and, mm -hmm. uh, which includes alcoholism, mm -hmm. and, uh, but still engaged in politics and came back into government with Deval Patrick. Um, I loved serving as Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development. Uh, it, it was a job with so much uh, meaning and impact. I was secretary during the last Great Recession um, back in 2008 and, uh, and 9. Um, and I learned a lot, obviously, about the operations of government and saw so many ways that uh, we could improve the operations of government if we had better access to data to information about how government really is working, how efficiently money is being spent, how priorities are being set, um, and, uh, and the like. And it was that experience, that really hands-on experience um, in state government that caused me to run for state auditor so that we could uh, bring uh, more of the information that government collects to bear mm -hmm. in determining how well government is performing its obligations to the citizens. Mm. So tell us, tell us more about that, about the auditor's office, because a lot of people, they don't know about the no. auditor's office and what they do and the importance of the work that you do. Well, first of all, let's, let's say what we don't do. We don't do financial auditing, and we don't audit individuals or taxpayers, unless you happen to do business with the, uh, with the Commonwealth. Um, but, so we audit the performance of state agencies. Uh, it's, it, our, our mandate is to audit uh, some aspect of every agency operation on a three-year cycle, um, and to do so in accordance with government standards that are set by the federal government so that, uh, so that all state auditors, even though their actual responsibilities may change, some of them, for instance, do only do financial auditing and others of us only do perform what's called performance auditing, 
Um, and so what performance auditing means is that we look to see whether agencies, first of all, um, how the, if, if they can account for the resources that they've been given through legislative mm -hmm. appropriations, for instance. Um, so are they safeguarding um, and using properly the money that's been appropriated? Are they safeguarding and using properly the other resources that they have, equipment um, and the like? Um, and are they meeting their mission um, to serve the public, whatever the agency is, whether it's environmental protection or child protection. Um, is the agency doing all that it can with the resources that it has to meet public need? Um, and so we, we have standards that we have to apply to our, uh, to our work. And you know, the idea is to bring about more efficiency and effectiveness in government spending and in government operations, and to also add that element of transparency and accountability. Um, so it, I think if the office, the office was created back in 1848, mm. and I think if it were being created today uh, in the 21st century, we might call it the Chief Accountability Officer. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, but that is because that is indeed the role of the state auditor mm. in Massachusetts. One of the high profile uh, audits you did in the past several years was the Department of Children and Family Services. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit and what sort of changes we saw that came out of that, that good audit? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, we've actually done over the course of my career in the auditor's office, which began in 2011, two audits of the Department of, of um, Children and Families. Uh, and uh, and the most, I think, the audit that you're referring mm. to, and I think it's the audit that actually, that we've done that has had the greatest um, human impact. I agree. Uh, yeah. Is the one that we did of DCF um, because what we looked at um, was the question of whether uh, the agency was keeping track of all of the medical and health needs of kids who are in their care. Um, some kids are, um, are maybe in foster settings. Some of those are long-term, some of those are short-term. Some kids are, um, once they're taking into state custody, are in group settings. Uh, and just because they're in state custody doesn't mean that they're safe. Right. Um, and so we were looking to see whether the agency was using all of the information to which it had access. This comes back to that whole data question. Are they using the information to which they have access in order to ensure that kids are safe? And we found that they weren't using all of the information that they had access to because, because we, we looked at the record keeping of the social workers and we saw when we looked at that information and compared it to information that was being collected by a sister state agency, mm. Mass Health, um, because all kids in foster care, uh, in state custody, get their health care through Mass Health. Correct. Because they weren't checking Mass Health records, social workers did not know of many injuries that these kids had sustained. And I'm not talking about ki about bicycle bicycle falls yeah. and scraped knees. I'm talking about kids in state custody um, who were being brought to emergency rooms. Uh, with sexual abuse, with suicide attempts, with broken bones and stabbings and poisonings. Now granted, we're not talking about thousands of children, we were talking about hundreds of children, but still we're talking about hundreds of children. Um, One is and, too much. Uh, exactly, and so, um, so you know, the point of the audit was to uh, make the agency aware that it could be getting better information if they were using accessing this information from their sister agency so that social workers would have more timely information. So as soon as a kid goes into an emergency room, a record is generated at MassHealth and the social worker would know. So they're not waiting for somebody else to tell them that a child um, has been brought into an emergency room or a doctor's office. Um, and, um, and so that, uh, it, it, at first, the agency was reluctant to do it. Um, it, you know, how are we going to handle this? 
Um, but then they figured out that, yeah, we can, we can do this. Uh, we, uh, they have medical social workers now who just automatically get notified by the Mass Health program um, that, uh, that a child in state custody uh, is, uh, is getting a service. And so we are much able to respond much better to, to take a child out of a dangerous situation, um, to remove foster parents or even group homes from a list of eligible um, uh, individuals and institutions to, to uh, take care of, of kids in state custody. So that audit made a great deal to, um, uh, obviously, to kids in foster care, but also to our staff, because it really showed the impact that you can have just by using information across state agencies to figure out how to make them work better. Yeah, yeah that's, that's just a great example of, of one of many things your office yeah. has done over the years, but kudos to you and your staff. And, and doing th some research, I saw that during your 11-year tenure that uh, your office has identified uh, close to $1.5 billion worth of inefficiencies and misspending and fraud. Yeah, you know, and, um, and I have to say, I was just referring to Mass Health. Um, much of that, uh, of that number comes from uh, what are called improper payments mm -hmm. within the mass health system. Um, we, don't, we, we do detect fraud. We don't detect as much fraud as we do just systemic failures. Um, paying doctors for procedures, for the same procedure, multiple times because somehow the system isn't checking that they're that, they're, um, that they have already been paid for that. Um, not understanding some of the contractual relationships that the agency has with managed care organizations and, and question of who pays a doctor's bill. Is it the state agency itself or is it the managed care organization that they are paying to pay the doctor's bills? Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of, of, of administrative um, inefficiencies uh, and, uh, and errors that we detect. We just did a, an audit. First time uh, in many, many years, we actually teamed up with the Federal uh, Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General. They approached us, could we collaborate with them? They were trying to, um, to foster more state-federal cooperation around the Medicaid program, which we call Mass Health, and they asked us if, um, if we would team up, and we did, and we looked at, um, uh, at the hospice program and saw that the state was not identifying everybody who's on Mass Health who went into the hospice program, um, and that was a waste of state resources because if you're in the hospice program, then the federal government pays not state to government, not state taxpayers. So we saw how they could improve their operations there and reduce the costs of our own state program by making sure that the federal government was paying for mm. it. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, you know, you, you say this often that the key to your results uh, in your department really is about recruitment of talented and diverse workforce. Can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, and technology, of course. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, it is, it is, um, frankly, sometimes difficult um, to attract people to government um, and to these positions because people don't really understand what right, it is that, right. they, that, that we do. Um, and we do attract a number of folks who have a strong financial background, uh, an accounting background, um, most particularly. But we're also looking for people who have been government managers or maybe even have been policy analysts or just have an ability to handle numbers because obviously even in performance auditing it still is about numbers sure. it still is about how many how much you're spending um, it still is about uh, you know, how many kids are in the mm -hmm. system and how you're tracking them uh, and and all but it's also about understanding um, how government works and the kinds of areas of government where things could go wrong. Um, you know, if you're a trained accountant, you don't necessarily think about DCF and, right. and, and how that agency uh, operates to, uh, to, to help kids in, in troubled situations. You don't necessarily think about how effectively the Department of Conservation and Recreation is administering 
its leases of state property to utility companies or to parking um, lot operators. Uh, mm. So you need to have people um, in the office who can, as I say, um, you know, see the forest mm -hmm. and not just the trees. Mm -hmm. So what's the big picture? What is the mission of this agency? Where could things go wrong? Um, how do we make sure that this agency is best serving the public? Um, you don't necessarily get that training um, and, uh, with a bachelor's in accounting. Right. Those, are, those are great analytical skills that you mm -hmm. develop, but we need people who can ask the, the big sure. picture questions yeah. as well. Um, and frankly, those folks, if you have that skill set, you don't necessarily think about coming to state government. You true. think about where can I make a lot of money. <laughs> true, true. Um, but, but the impact that you can have um, on audits, whether it is uh, you're looking at the efficiency of uh, whether the DCR is, is tracking it's keeping track of its leases and if we're getting fair market value for them. I mean, that's, that is important, but so is the DCF sure, audit. Sure, sure, sure. Now, your office has received numerous uh, national awards, mm -hmm. uh, and you're really a national leader uh, in this area. Can you talk a little bit about that and your yeah, role in the national spotlight? You know, th th that, has been, um, that has been a source of terrific satisfaction. I mean, not just for me, mm. though frankly it is, mm. um, yeah, <laughs> but also for the audit staff, sure. because much of the work that we do does not generate headlines. Mm. Um, and, and, and to know that you, what you're doing is well regarded by your peers, um, that you're able to make a difference in identifying efficiency um, and effectiveness areas for improvement. Um, uh, you know, by meeting government standards uh, is a source of great pride. Um, when I took office, uh, we were not regularly being reviewed by other state auditors through a peer review process um, that is highly suggested and virtually every state auditor in the, in the country goes through the process. It, you're not required by law to do that. But it's a good practice. It is, a, yeah. it is definitely a best practice. So uh, when I asked for the first peer review to be done of the office, we did not score well at all. And so right from the get-go. Was that the beginning of your term? Yeah, yeah. in 2011. Yeah. So right from the get-go, we had to devise a plan for how we were going to meet government standards. And that meant, um, that meant introduction of new technology. It also meant um, understanding what the standards were and how to apply them in every single audit that we that we do it's required a lot of training it's required new you know new skill sets in the office it required a quality assurance program um, so that our work uh, the auditors work gets checked for accuracy and completeness and objectivity and the like before it goes out um, the door so adherence to those standards in government auditing um, is really important to the folks in uh, in our office and it is to me and that's how we're able to um, to win these awards because they're based on the audit impact but also on audit integrity and completeness and conformance with uh, yeah. with national standards yeah, that's, that's true uh, it's great yeah, great, it, great great stuff yeah, yeah it really is well you know I think that uh, it comes down to modeling the behavior mm -hmm. you right. expect of the agencies that you're auditing you know, well, if we're not going to follow standards, why should they? Why should anybody else? Exactly, exactly. right. So it, Checks it, and balances. And it gives us a great deal of credibility then when we are when we find um, problems in state agencies uh, that maybe they want to uh, in initially dispute. But we have a record of more than 90% of our recommendations, our audit recommendations being adopted by state agencies. Wow. Even wow. when they fuss and even when they push back, as they did, for instance, I mentioned that hospice audit. They said, no, no, we, we disagree with your findings, but we're going to do everything you say that we should do sure. in order to improve the program. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, yeah. so you just take some of it with a grain of salt mm -hmm. and you just know that you are making an impact, even if the agency only admits it grudgingly. Right, right, right. Listen, um, the uh, police reform law, Mm -hmm. That's been a hot topic the last couple of years, and your office has uh, 
uh, has really been involved with this. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you've been doing and sure. what the future looks like? Sure. The work that we did um, around police training actually did not arise from an audit. Um, we also have a, uh, an off a, a small group of folks in my office. Uh, co it's called the Division of Local Mandates. And we look, as the name suggests, um, at state mandates on local governments. Right. And uh, the original intent of the office was to serve uh, as sort of the, uh, the, ar the, the, the arbitrator of, uh, of the question of who should pay for a program that you and the state legislature mm -hmm. uh, impose upon municipalities. Um, and in the years of our doing that and working with the legislature, you guys have become much more conscientious mm -hmm. about whether the state or the local taxpayers need to pay for, for mm -hmm. these programs. Um, and so we have made much more use of another authority there. And we look at, um, at programs that communities have to fulfill uh, in order to meet state requirements that don't meet the le legal definition of state mandate. I won't get into the distinction mm -hmm. between what common sense tells you is a mandate mm -hmm. and what the law says is mm -hmm. a mandate. But at any rate, so we were looking at the burden being borne by, mu by municipalities, municipal police departments, for police training. Um, because the state mandates that every police officer get 40 hours of, of, uh, of training every year, mm -hmm. not just when they're um, initially brought into the brought mm -hmm. into the ranks, um, but every but every year. Um, and we saw though that uh, that the state was contributing relatively little in the way of of um, covering those costs as compared to municipalities, because municipalities were having to pay not just for the cost of training, but also then they have to pay the police officers for time spent in training, sure. and then they have to fill um, sure. you know, the, 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 the slots, yeah. backfill the slots, um, which often means overtime. And so uh, we, we, we just looked at the disproportionate burden on municipalities in order to comply with the state requirement. Um, and we, in the course of looking at, at the state's requirements for police training, we naturally <coughs> talked a lot to police chiefs um, who also pointed out that, um, that there wasn't tracking of whether the training was taking place um, and there was no system for enforcing the training requirement or for otherwise ensuring that uh, police officers were getting trained in what they needed to learn because as we know s police officers are asked to um, uh, uh, perform many different kinds of tasks than they were originally and so so through the course of of those discussions we came to embrace the idea um, of improving police training accountability through um, what's referred to as the po a post system 44 other states had some version of peace officer standards and training programs in place. Um, Massachusetts did not. Um, there had been a good deal of advocacy for doing this. Um, we put out a report uh, at the end of 2019 that detailed the municipal costs, but also detailed the advantages of a post system for ensuring that accountability in police training. Um, a few Short months later, uh, you know, tragically, we had the death at, uh, of George Floyd, um, and members of the legislature, um, including one of your colleagues from the Cape, um, David Vieira, yes. um, who had been very interested in this, as well as members of the Black and Latino Caucus, picked up on this um, on this report, on the recommendation for a post system, and that helped to um, inject that into the, the conversations, the deliberations that the legislature ultimately had in how to respond to, mm -hmm. um, uh, to excessive force and you know, racial justice issues in the, mm -hmm. in the Commonwealth. And yes, and that, and that report has won a couple of different mm -hmm. awards uh, from, from mm -hmm. folks who have um, 
you know, who looked at, again, the quality of the report and the impact of the report. It was a great report. report. Yeah, it really was, it really was. In the, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I, I want to get to the fact that, uh, first of all, thank you for your years of service uh, to you. the Commonwealth. We really appreciate what you really have done as auditor as well. Um, as you said, it's not a lot of fanfare, which I think is good sometimes when you're not in the front yeah. page of the newspaper. That means you're doing your job, and I think you've been doing your job very well. Um, but you've recently announced that you're, you're not running for re-election. No. What do you look to get accomplished uh, in the next you know, few months or a year and a half that you're going to be still there? Well, um, frankly, uh, we, have, we still have a lot of IT initiatives, um, again, so it's improving. Um, it's improving our ability to, uh, to access uh, data in order to uh, ensure better government uh, performance. Um, and I suppose, I guess, another part of it is that I really want to make sure that people uh, have an understanding, the public has an understanding of what it is that we mm -hmm. do do. So that's why I yeah, that's jumped at this yeah, opportunity. I'm so happy that, um, because yeah. there's a big decision that sure. has to be made as yes. to who is going yep. to take over, what their vision for the office will be. And for me, that means how they interpret the idea of accountability. Mm -hmm. Because accountability gets, is a term that gets thrown around by a lot of people. And for <coughs> some people, accountability just means finding somebody to blame right. for something right. that went wrong. Right. Well, my experience in government, particularly my experience as auditor, says that rarely is there one person to blame when something mm -hmm. goes wrong sure. in state government and that there is a systemic problem. And, and so for me, accountability is not, um, is not finding someone to blame. It's trying to understand what are the resources that need to be brought to bear in order to, uh, to, to get a job done well. How well are you monitoring those activities um, uh, going forward, identifying risks of failure, uh, you know, what can go wrong, um, what are you investing to make in, to keep the agency current and its ability to do its job, uh, uh, you know, at, 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 at the top level, so that you can meet public expectations. It's not about finding scapegoats mm -hmm. and uh, you know nailing scalps to the mm -hmm. uh, to the to the wall. Um, it is about doing the just the detailed work of looking at government operations mm -hmm. and and. Mm -hmm. and finding out how we can do a better job for yeah, the public. That's, you know, and you bring up a great point. We have an election in November 2022. It's going to be important. There's a lot of people going to be running for auditor. People should watch this show. This will be shown all over the Commonwealth. <laughs> people should watch this show to find out exactly how the auditor uh, office works and how it should be run. So, so again, we want to thank you for, for coming here. And I know Thanks. you're going to have a lot more work with COVID money coming in as well. Yes, so actually, that is, yeah, that is going to happen. That's a huge priority. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do with that $5.6 billion of oversight mm. that we as legislators are going to be giving away at right. some point soon. So, so again, I, I want to thank you so much for coming Thanks. down. I appreciate that. And, again, appreciate everything you've done as, as auditor. Thanks. And, and I appreciate the opportunity that the voters have, uh, have given me uh, to yeah. do this work great over honor, what will be 12 years. Yeah, it's a great honor, isn't it? Thank you. Serve the people. Yeah, it really is. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed today's show and, and found it to be so informative. And again, a big thanks to the auditor, a big thanks to, uh, to Dave and Donna here in the studio and the, the great folks here at PAC-TV for another wonderful show. Uh, thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time on State Matters.